All righty, and here we go. So welcome everyone, Denise, <laughs> and <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> your you. listeners, um, for joining us this blizzardy Tuesday for our webinar about the upcoming City Nature Challenge, which is happening from April 27th through 30th. Um, Marie and I both work at Encyclopedia of Life, and we were both organizers um, out of a bunch of different institutions around Boston last year during the City Nature Challenge, and we're um, obviously also involved this year. So we are taking what we learned from last year's City Nature Challenge, um, we've reflected on it, and we've built up a bunch of new resources that we're excited to share with you this afternoon. That's great. So before we begin, just wanted to give a quick introduction. So uh, my name is Amy Lorenz, and I'm the curriculum coordinator at the Encyclopedia of Life, which is a global biodiversity project. Um, it's across a bunch of different institutions, but right at Harvard, um, that's where the learning and education group of Encyclopedia of Life is housed. So Marie is um, our director of our group, and we basically try to create, or we don't just try to create, we actually do create um, educational materials about the world's biodiversity. So the City Nature Challenge being a international celebration and kind of competition about biodiversity is a really, really great place uh, for Encyclopedia of Life to fit in to creating educational materials. And Marie, do you wanna add anything? No, I think you covered it, but uh, again, we're just really excited to participate in this and to have whoever will be joining us. Great. So over the next 30 minutes or so, that's uh, sort of our goal, we are going to cover in this webinar uh, an introduction to the City Nature Challenge and to iNaturalist, which is the observation platform that we in the U.S. will be using in the City Nature Challenge. And uh, here too for, will be referred to as the CNC because City Nature Challenge is quite a mouthful. Um, we'll also discuss different ways that you can get involved with the CNC in Boston, um, whether you are a formal educator, um, an informal educator, or you work with a Girl Scout troop, um, or you are one of our partners in one of our local organizations. Um, we'll discuss a few of the different ways you can get involved and then we will break out of this presentation and do a quick demonstration of how to use iNaturalist both the website and the mobile app and then finally we will dig into some of the educational materials and see what and show you um, what what we have available that's both um, locally here in Boston and an international education toolkit um, that you may want to incorporate into your classroom or your field program to use with students or whatever audience you work with. So the City Nature Challenge is an example of what's referred to as a bio blitz. A bio blitz is a brief intensive survey of biodiversity over a set area and time. And bio blitzes come in all shapes and sizes, um, from doing a two hour bio blitz in your backyard or your schoolyard, um, to a multiple day event across a city or national parks. So in 2016, for example, the National Park Service launched um, a, a celebration for their centennial. And uh, in many parks across the country, um, mostly around like on one weekend they had bio blitzes within the national parks and we'll show you later on iNaturalist how you can define an area and a time for a bio blitz. So the City Nature Challenge is a really great example of a large-scale bio blitz and so the City Nature Challenge is uh, was first started in 2016 as a competition between San Francisco and Los Angeles. And the whole City Nature Challenge from the first year until now and moving forward has been organized primarily by 
the Natural History Museum of LA and the Cal Academy of Sciences up in San Francisco. So back in 2016, the two cities had a competition against each other using iNaturalist as their platform. They equipped their citizens with uh, smartphones and sent them out to go observe as many species as possible in seven days. And then last year, because that was a great success the first year, they extended the invitation to any city in the U.S. And so we heard about it here in Boston and got really excited. I thought it would be a great opportunity for us to explore our local diversity and, um, and get our uh, people in the Boston area out and um, digging around to see what, what kind of species we have around here. So that occurred last year from April 14th to 18th. There were 16 cities in the country who participated, and we came in about eighth place. So that was pretty good. The most important part was that we actually beat New York City. So that was pretty big, and that, that's definitely our biggest competitor again this year. I think they've already, in New York, they've already been telling everybody, oh, we're gonna beat Boston, but they don't even know. So <laughs> this year, in 2018, um, the City Nature Challenge has been expanded again uh, to any city uh, around the world who wants to participate. And so far, there are about, well, kind of somewhere between 65 and 70 cities around the world are participating. And they come in, the, in like a huge variety of sizes um, from, I think, Dubuque, Minnesota, or, oh, Duluth, Minnesota, um, to like, Mumbai or something. So there's a huge variety of, of places that are participating this year, but it, it goes across, I think, 17 countries and five continents. And I believe Antarctica is even participating. So it's pretty exciting. Um, next year and, and moving further um, from there, the City Nature Challenge, we're not, I mean, it's just gonna keep on growing. We're, we're excited to be a part of it. So. Um, we're going to dig in a little bit to what the results are were from the City Nature Challenge last year, and then we will focus on what's coming up this year. So here is a map of the cities who participated last year. You can see it is really nicely spread across the country, um, and there was really sort of a large amount of coverage when you look at our map. So this year, I can't remember, I, f I think there's 40 something cities in the US participating this year, which is really exciting. And here are the overall results from the City Nature Challenge. Um, so this is actually something that we'll look at a little bit later. This is a project in iNaturalist and it tallies all the totals for the people the number of species and the observations that were made across the City Nature Challenge last year. So um, there were over 126,000 observations made of about 8,630 species and um, over 4,000 people participated across the country. So it was a really, really big uh, event nationwide. Also, it was by far the biggest um, event that's ever happened on iNaturalist. And I think in those five days from last year, more, more um, observations and species were uploaded to iNaturalist than the rest of iNaturalist combined. And um, so going, moving a little bit more local here, this, these are our results from the Boston City Nature Challenge last year. So we were just shy of 4,000 uh, observations of about 747 species. And uh, we had about, what, Marie, like five, six weeks to prepare for the City Nature Challenge. So it wasn't a ton of time, but still 260 people participated last year. We've known um, about the CNC for several months now, so we're excited and we're hoping that we can more than double all of these totals. Um, we'd love to hit 10,000 observations. We'd love to double the number of species we have and double, at least double the number of people who participate. So here's a map of all the cities participating this year so far, and that changes. Um, that's likely going to change a little bit more. 
And it looks like Andy just joined us. Hi, Andy. Um, so this is a map of the area around Boston that is included currently in the City Nature Challenge. And you'll notice a couple things about it. Um, it's obviously much larger than Boston itself. Um, based on the other cities that are participating across the country, uh, they're really, they vary widely in their geographic area and also their population size. So in Boston, we wanted to include a wide range of habitats that we could explore from the like urban center of Boston out. So on the northwest and southern side of Boston around the area, that's uh, our, we used Route 495 as our boundary. And because that really kind of goes out to a pretty rural landscape out there. And then we also thought that our marine habitats around here are, are so rich and they're such a part of our culture that we wanted to include as much of them as possible. So we extended the eastern boundary out into the ocean to incorporate um, all of our coastline all the way out to Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. So we do have a lot of the whale watch boats and NOAA who are going to be helping to make marine observations during the, city, the CNC. So we're pretty excited about that. It's also, you know, happening at the end of April if we're competing against places like um, Dallas and Miami and LA that are like going to be super warm by that point. We need to uh, make up for the <laughs> the terrestrial diversity that might not quite be back yet in the spring. So that's where plankton come in handy. Alrighty. So um, so the way that the City Nature Challenge is organized is kind of in two phases. The first phase is the observation phase, and this is occurring from April 27th through 30th. Um, and over those four days, everyone can go out around the geographic area that I just showed you and make any observations of plants, animals, fungi, even microorganisms, anything that's alive, um, and share it on iNaturalist. And then the second phase of the CNC, once the observation period's over, then we have our identification phase. So this is when if you, have, if you weren't able to spend time to make identifications of what you found around the area, you can go and try to find, identify your own observations or others. Um, we have a lot of experts in the area who have volunteered to help go and look at things like, um, like reptiles and amphibians of invertebrates and things like that. So we'll have a lot of experts that will be looking on iNaturalist and helping us make our identifications as best as possible. So I'll come back to this a little bit more when I show you iNaturalist and, um, and kind of explain how the, how the identifications work. Did I hear somebody maybe have a question? Um, Denise and Andy, I'm actually going to, if you don't mind, I'm just going to mute, mute you for now because I'm getting some feedback somewhere. If you have a question, you can just um, unmute yourself. There's a little button at the bottom of your, of your screen. Great. So how can you get involved with the City Nature Challenge? Well, there's sort of a, there's, there's a wide variety of ways you can get involved. Um, the first is through observations. You can either go out and make observations on your own. You can join an organized event on our City Nature Challenge website, um, which you will find, I don't know if, to, I can't actually see the bottom of this, of this slide. Um, you can find on the bottom of most of our slides, it's, it's zoonewengland.com slash city nature challenge. Um, that is the hub for where you can find local info. And that's places that you can go make observations or organize events that are happening. Um, the zoo is going to have a kickoff event and then there are going to be specialized uh, walks and larger bio blitzes all around the Boston area over those five over those four days. 
Um, you can lead your own event if you um, work at a nature center or at a school and you want to organize your own thing. You can absolutely do that. If you want that to be publicized um, and put on our website, you can just um, send an e email, Marie, to on the website, right? You can. Right, or you can just send it to me or to Amy and we'll get it up. And we'll add it to the calendar. And then finally, you can participate in a data quest, which I will also get into a little bit more detail later, but it's basically um, more focused uh, studies or observations for specific types of organisms. So the other ways that you can get involved are by training others at your school or nature center or, any, or in your community uh, about how to use iNaturalist, or how to get involved in the CNC. And then finally, you can help identify organisms on iNaturalist during the observation or the identification phase of the CNC. And I keep mentioning that we're using iNaturalist. Um, and the really great thing about the City Nature Challenge is that this isn't just um, an event where what you see is something that you can you know, take a picture of and then it disappears. The, the observations that we are making here in Boston have both a local impact and a global impact. So um, locally, there are many researchers or conservation managers that are really interested in looking at the types of species um, that, that are observed in April, and that's um, the time of year that they're observed, where species are being observed, and things like that. So what we're observing is of local interest. And then also, I'm gonna show you how the contributions that we make using iNaturalist actually move from that website into global open science projects, making the, the data from these observations available across the world. So iNaturalist, <laughs> which I keep coming back to um, because this is really where it all happens. Um, iNaturalist is a website and a smartphone app where you can record observations of what you're seeing in the natural world. You can share those with, with fellow naturalists. It's, um, it's as much a social platform, really, as it is a place for you to store um, and upload what you're finding. So what's really great is that you can take a picture of something, even if you don't know what it is, you can put it onto iNaturalist and someone, other people in the community can help um, identify that organism. And there's lots of different conversations that go on on iNaturalist. Um, you know, if I took a picture of like a snail, um, I couldn't identify it and other members of the community helped me narrow it down a little bit, but they also, you know, recommended to me, like, next time you see a snail, make sure you get a shot of the top of its shell, make sure that you have a, like, a ruler to measure it with, take a picture of the underside of the shell if possible, um, and that, that's something that I didn't know before about, about observing snails and slugs, so it's a great way to learn about what to, what to look for. And I'm going to pop out real quick, and so here's just a quick video for you. iNaturalist is a social network where anyone can record and share their photographs of living things. When you share a photograph on iNaturalist, it becomes more than just a picture. It becomes an observation. It's a record of an organism in a place at a time. Each observation is shared with a global community of naturalists where it can be identified, discussed, and used to give us a greater understanding of life on Earth. Wherever you are, biodiversity is there too. Get out and observe it. Cool, so that's kind of a quick overview of what iNaturalist, of what iNaturalist is at a large scale. Um, and so now I'll sort of demonstrate how the observations that we make in iNaturalist move from that website to other open science platforms.
So I naturalistic. Amy? Yeah. Um, your volume just went down after that. So I don't know if you can put it up yeah. a little bit. This looks like it's, as, it's up as high as it goes. Okay, that's great. No problem. Is this, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I'll move closer too. So iNaturalist is basically um, the gateway to these open science, other open science websites. And so if you make an observation and upload it onto iNaturalist, a couple of things happen. So first, this is an example of an observation. This is from um, a school bio blitz that we were a part of in the Florida Panhandle. So this picture was taken by a third grader at Riverside Elementary. And so you can see there's a picture of the butterfly. There's a map that's kind of blocked, but there's the location, um, that little red flag is the location where the picture was taken. And then it also has a time on it that's not, not in this image, but. Um, so if an image has, or if an observation has either an image or a sound, a location, and a timestamp, then that has all the important information to make this observation verifiable by other people in the iNaturalist community. And so on iNaturalist, there will often be a discussion in which members of the community come to a consensus about the identification of what you what you um, put onto the site. So um, Javier <laughs> identified this butterfly as a buckeye, and it, that's a, the genus of the butterfly. And then a few other people agreed um, that actually were able to narrow it down even more and identify it as a common buckeye. Once about two thirds of the people who participate in a discussion on iNaturalist agree. If the observation has a photo and a location and a timestamp, it becomes a research grade quality. So now we can see that the community identification is common buckeye and it becomes research grade. And this is where um, research grade quality observations on iNaturalist, this is, um, this is where they move from this website into the larger um, open science world. And that's open science is the term for, for, um, observ or for science, scientific information being available widely, globally. Um, and in this case, we're looking at biodiversity data. So iNaturalist is one part, one piece of sort of a network of, um, of sites that are places to share, to store, um, biodiversity data and information. So once an observation becomes research grade, the observation data flows to two places. The first is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or we, what we call GBIF, and then the Encyclopedia of Life, where Marie and I work. And both of these are global biodiversity open resources where you can find all sorts of information about species on Earth. So this is on GBIF, you can see the picture of the butterfly. And on this map, one of those little dots somewhere in the Florida Panhandle is um, the observation of this butterfly. And remember, a third grader took this picture. So now you can see how the, the image and all the information um, about this observation is now out publicly um, on, on GBIF. And then an Encyclopedia of Life, you'll see um, the image of this butterfly will eventually be on a page about the common buckeye. And so that means that anyone who wants to learn about or is looking for information about different species can find it on these biodiversity resources. Also, researchers often go to EOL and GBIF to get important um, data that they're using for their studies. So it's a great way for what we find here locally to be used locally by, uh, by interested conservation managers and things like that, but also to share what we're finding with a global community. So I'll stop there for a second and see. Marie, do you have anything you wanna add or does anyone have any questions? 
No, I think um, from my perspective, Amy, you're, you're right on track. You're keeping things going. Um, I do want to just a time check. It is 4.30. It is. So yeah. we'll just carry on. <laughs> 30 minutes <laughs> sounded like it was gonna work but I always get excited and talk too much so um, but the next part is going to be I think pretty fun and I'll just keep on moving as quickly as I can so the next thing I want to jump into is um, just to show you iNaturalist and so how to get started with iNaturalist and how um, to join the City Nature Challenge project for yourself um, and so you can show your students or other people in your community how to participate. Okay, so here is the iNaturalist website, iNaturalist.org. You can log in or sign up there. So I'll just log in real quick. And there's lots of great things you can find on iNaturalist. Um, I won't spend a lot of time getting into the details of those, but you can explore global observations on, um, th through this map. Uh, you can search for species. You can also, you can search for location. Um, you can filter for species so, or for groups of organisms. So if you're looking for um, reptiles that have been seen in um, Australia, you can do that. And so there have been 418 species of, of reptiles observed in Australia. And you can explore that on the map. So there's a lot of really fun things you can do with this. It's also super user friendly. And so it's a great tool to use, not just for making our observations during the City Nature Challenge, but, um, and I'll get to this in the educational materials that in our education toolkit, you can find activities to, um, to use with students to introduce them to iNaturalist through a series of exploration activities, and then even to do a data analysis activity after the CNC. So the most important thing to know now is that you'll want to join the City Nature Challenge project. And so to do that, you go to under the projects tab at the top, and search for City Nature oops, Challenge 2018 Boston area. And even if you just do part of that, you'll still find us um, in the results. You'll want to click on that, and that'll bring you to our project page. The project is really important because this is how uh, iNaturalist will tally what is observed, and this is what uh, will be used in in our global competition. So once the City Nature Challenge starts, this project will start tallying how many people, species, and observations get added. Um, but the, the really important part is that this is also how we communicate with you as a project member. So in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see this join project. I'm already a member, so it doesn't say that, but you'll see it says join this project. So you click on that and follow the prompts until you are a member. And then you'll see our map here. And then underneath the map is what we call the journal. And so before the CNC, um, we'll be posting updates and info here in the journal. And that's how you can find out info, um, any updates that we have. You'll get an email about that. So that's how iNaturalist really um, houses and uses all of the observations that we'll make during the CNC. So let me pop back to PowerPoint. Great. And so just briefly, I also wanted to show you how, um, how it all works in iNaturalist. So we've kind of gone over some of the broad scale things about what happens to your observations and why they're important. Um, but when you are making an observation using iNaturalist, you can do this in a few different ways. You can either take pictures on a digital camera and upload them through the website. They have a really great way for you to upload lots of images at once. Um, you can also use a smartphone app. It's just called iNaturalist. It's super user-friendly, easy, and fun to use out in the field. Um, and so 
when you do make an observation, you'll need to document what you saw, um, when you saw it, and then a photo or a sound of it. And if you use your phone or other mobile device and you use the location services, your phone will automatically be entering that data when you put your observation in. So I will demonstrate that for you now. Um, you can also, if you do use like a camera, you can always add that. You know, if you put in a picture, you can mark on the map where you saw it and when you saw it. Okay, so we're gonna make an observation right now. And since I can't go outside and take a picture of something, I'm going to bring the observation inside. Let me know if you can see my screen. Can you see it? Yep. We, have, yeah, we, yeah. See, we, awesome. see, your, we see your iPhone screen. Perfect. Right? Yep. Okay. Okay. So here you can see um, on the second row down is my iNaturalist app. And this is, um, this is really great for making observations. It's not so great for exploring observations. So there's definitely a lot of really great features that you can get on the website that you can't really get on the app. But as far as making observations go, it's super easy. So um, I'm going to click the observe icon at the bottom. And you can either take a new picture or you can, in the bottom, there's like the little picture. You can go to your camera roll. And so if you took a picture last week, you can go and find that and use that picture or image. So I'm gonna take a picture of this butterfly that I just found. And click next. And so the next thing that I need to do is document what I saw. And so iNaturalist is really great because they can actually help you view, or they can help um, find suggestions for you based on a complicated algorithm. So they can recognize certain parts of, um, of images and try to help narrow down what you saw, which is really helpful. It's also not always perfect. So I do actually, I think I already know what this species is, but we'll just check and see what, what iNaturalist thinks it is. So you click, what did you see? iNaturalist will load its suggestions. Sometimes it takes a minute. <laughs> so iNaturalist is pretty sure that it's in the genus Nymphalis or tortoise shells. Um, and I know based on what I've seen um, in the past that this species is a mourning cloak, which is the first, the first um, choice that iNaturalist gives us. So it's great. In this case, it was able to correctly identify this species and I know that. Um, so I can just click mourning cloak which is great. Or if I don't, if I'm not sure what it was, I can actually search for it myself. So you actually, you don't need to put in the species name for what you're finding. You don't need to know the species. Um, if you don't even know what kind of animal you saw, you can just put in animal. So when you want to look up and basically you just need to tag what you see to a group. So if I'm not sure what it was, but I know it's a butterfly, I can start typing butterfly, and the first thing that pops up here is butterflies and moths. That's exactly what I want. So I just wanna make sure that I tag, I click on one of those options. It will tag it to the order Lepidoptera, and then other people in iNaturalist can come and help me narrow that down. So the next thing I wanna check, um, I have a date when I took the picture and a location. And if I want, I can add it to a project. I mentioned earlier that you don't actually need to add your observations into the City Nature Challenge project, but if I wanted to, I just click that and it will automatically add it to a project of my choice. And then I click save um, and then upload. I'm not actually gonna upload this one because this is not a real <laughs> butterfly. <laughs> so the, the app is super easy to use. And it's really great for, for all ages. All righty. So there's also great 
um, resources on the iNaturalist website. So they have tutorials and videos um, at the bottom of this slide. You'll see taking better photos for iNaturalist that gives you tips for, you know, how far to be away from something, what picture or what, um, how many pictures you want to take um, and, and things like that. So the most important thing is that you want to make an observation of wild organisms. Um, while you can take pictures of things like trees that have been planted or um, plants in a garden, you can. The only organisms that will be included or that could become research grade um, are things that are wild. You want to make sure that you focus on just one species. So if I have, um, you know, I don't want to just take a picture of like a garden of flowers. I want to focus on one of those plants, one of those flowers, if possible. Um, try to make your photo clear and in focus. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult for others to help identify it. If you know it, you can name it. And if you don't, you can just tag it um, at a higher level, like butterflies and moths, for other people in the community. So that's iNaturalist. It's, a, it's pretty exciting. I really I, I recommend um, spending plenty of time practicing it, practicing with iNaturalist before using it with students um, so that you can help teach them how to use it. So the final thing that we'd like to cover are the resources that are out there. Um, if any of you are educators, then there are lots of uh, tools that we've been working on building over the last year to make the City Nature Challenge, which is in itself a really great opportunity to get students outside and exploring, learning about life science, um, connecting to uh, Massachusetts science standards and next generation science standards. Um, it's great uh, in itself for that. So we have been working on some different resources to really tie it all together um, to build some of those skills, those field skills and observation skills ahead of time to give you some tips and tricks for teaching, bringing kids outside and leading activities in the field and then follow up activities um, to really uh, help students understand how what they saw during the City Nature Challenge fits into the global picture. So one of the, the, the first thing that we have is the education, the International City Nature Challenge Education Toolkit. Um, this is something that we collaborated with a bunch of other organizations around the US and um, around the world to create. And so there's basically three different types or three steps um, of resources. The first is uh, step one is get ready to bring your students or kids outside. So we, there's a guide for with tips for facilitating, managing, and supporting outdoor learning and inquiry. Step two is learning how to use iNaturalist. So I gave you a really super brief overview of iNaturalist today, um, but that we have a more in-depth guide um, and activities that uh, will introduce you and students to iNaturalist, specifically for the City Nature Challenge. And then step three is integrate the, all of this into your education program. So we have curated progressions of classroom and field activities, media and other um, web tools and field tools organized um, by audience. So we have you know, four or five activities for kindergarten through second grade, third through fifth, and so on, um, all the way up to university and general public audiences. The next thing that we have available in all of this, you'll see um, the URL at the bottom of the screen, which I actually can't see right now. Um, but it should be. Yeah, it does, it does show, uh, Amy. And yeah. I think we also have a final slide with, um, with, all with lots of resources as well. Great. So the other resources that you can find on there are our EOL species cards. So these are one of the materials that, that we work on at Encyclopedia of Life. They're basically baseball cards um, or Pokemon cards, but for species. And so we have decks that cover species in uh, our New England habitats, including rocky intertidal zones, urban habitats, vernal pools, uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery, and Wright Farm, which is uh, agricultural fields and woodlands. Um, and so those decks themselves are really great tools, both like to learn about species ahead of time um, and could even be brought into the field. So you can download those decks and print them and cut them out and they're ready to go. 
Uh, the other thing that we have are is a, is a, the BioBlitz taxa deck, and that breaks down and gives um, characteristics of major groups of animals, plants, and fungi. So that's really helpful for bringing into the field or just understanding the differences between um, amphibians and reptiles and versus um, a bunch of different, you know, phyla of invertebrates. And the final tool that we have that's really great, um, not just for educators and students, but for anyone who's interested in taking the CNC in a little bit more of a focused direction. So we have been developing what we call data quests. And this is what links our observations to our local, to questions that are um, of local interest. And so there are six data quests that you can choose from that focus on observing specific organisms. Um, to address particular conservation needs. So, um, and I'll get into one example in a second, but there's delectable oysters, there's early flyers, that's, um, that's uh, butterflies, moths, and other pollinators that you might be able to find in April. Invasive plants, spring marvels are um, ident or observing um, skunk cabbage and the great squirrel hunt and then dandelion delights which is a great example of something um it's actually a project that a grad student at boston u at bu or no umass boston right marie yeah umass boston um was interested in so the what we observe the dandelions that we observe around the area are actually going to be our observations are going to be um, used by a grad student which is pretty cool so the great squirrel hunt is uh, is a uh, is my favorite example of a data quest right now because squirrels are everywhere. And did you know that we have six species of squirrels? Um, this project and this data quest is really focused on looking at the distribution or the the rural the type the species of squirrels that we see along a rural to urban gradient. And so in the city. Um, you may notice if you go, if you live in Boston or if you're around Boston a lot, there are a lot of eastern gray squirrels, whereas American red squirrels um, are species that you tend to see more out in more mature woodlands. Um, but we have two species of flying squirrels. There are groundhogs, which are a species of squirrel, and what else? Am I? Oh, and chipmunks. And so this project um, has three parts or really four parts. Um, all of the data quests on our website, which you can see at the bottom of this slide, um, you can get introductory information about the project itself. You can find a field guide, a species field guide. You can find biodiversity cards for the species. And then there's a link to an iNaturalist project. And so each of these data quests have their own project on iNaturalist. Um, which would be great for you to join so you can get updates. And then they'll also, um, any observations that you make during the City Nature Challenge will automatically go into those projects. But those are not confined to four days. Those are gonna be ongoing projects. Marie, do you have anything else you wanna add about the data quests or? No, sounds great, Amy. Okay. So, um, just to review, the CNC is a short, four-day, fun, gl global biodiversity challenge and competition against about 65 to 70 other cities around the world. There are lots of different ways we can get involved locally here in Boston for the CNC, um, observing on your own, attending our organized events, and making identifications on INAT. You can find info about all of those things on our website. Um, iNaturalist is a free open science resource, and it's what we'll be using here in the U.S. Um, for the City Nature Challenge. And then finally, there's uh, lots of education activities and toolkit, the toolkit data quests um, to help educators incorporate the CNC into your classroom or field program. So here's our slide with the important links um, that I kind of blew through, but this should give you um, here, getting started with iNaturalist, how to make observations on the app and on desktop, um, some great video tutorials, 
and links to our um, iNaturalist project page and then also our Boston CNC website that's hosted by the zoo. And I'm just going to chime in here because I know we've uh, given lots of websites that you might not have caught and also this is not yet posted. Um, if you see on the right hand side you see Amy's email and my email. If you want to uh, shoot us an email um, then we will send you the link to where this PowerPoint is and so you don't have to worry about missing anything. Mm -hmm. And we'll be posting this on the educator page um, of our local of the, the Zoo New England site. So, <laughs> um, so with that, I'm really excited that you are all able to join us today. Um, looking forward to getting some hopefully more spring-like weather before the City Nature Challenge. So we start to um, be able to observe some more plants and animals before the event itself. Um, I'd like to thank everybody on behalf of all of our partners, both here locally in Boston, in the Boston area, and then also our organizers in, uh, at the Cal Academy of Sciences and the Natural History Museum of LA for joining us. Uh, I, think, I mean, if anyone wants to stick around, we're happy to answer any questions.